Hey everybody, Grommos here with another DCS video, and this time I want to take a look at the A10C module for this simulator. The second module that was released for DCS after the original KA50 module, and to this day probably one of the most complex ones available for DCS. But certainly also lots of fun trying to master this plane and all the possibilities it provides. Now, I just started flying the A10C a few days ago, and with all the options the plane provides, I certainly make more than one video about it. But in this first one, I want to, as always, introduce the plane and the module a bit, and show some of its capabilities in a mission. So, let's take a quick look at the plane before we do that. Now, one of the things that makes the A10C module one of the more complex ones in DCS is the fact that the A10C has access to some of the most sophisticated and modern and most powerful equipment in this simulator. For example, the probably most powerful tool in air-to-ground combat currently in Digital Combat Simulator, the Lightning Targeting Bot. Now, the fact that the A10 in DCS is so comparably sophisticated might be surprising since the plane is not exactly new. As a matter of fact, development of the A10 began in the 1960s and the A10A started to enter service in the late 70s. And the original A10A, which we also have in DCS, that is one of the Flaming Cliffs 3 planes, is for the most part pretty straightforward. It has a single monitor to display the image from a Maverick TV or infrared sensor, but other than that, locating targets is pretty much up to the pilot's eyes. The plane was of course upgraded over time, and the latest and most extensive upgrade to the plane, the Suit 3 upgrade, added a whole lot of new capabilities to the plane, especially the addition of two multifunction displays and the capabilities to carry the lightning targeting bot, which brings with it, on top of being a powerful tool to find and identify targets at long range, the ability to use smart munitions like the JDAM bomb or laser guided GPUs as well as increasing the accuracy of dumb munitions as well as the cannon. Now, GPUs the plane could carry before, but lacking a laser, not used without a second aircraft or someone on the ground designating a target for it. With the lightning bot, the A10 can do that itself, since the targeting bot has a laser. Now, with this upgrade, the designation of the plane changed to A10C, and this version started to enter service in 2005, so relatively recently, only a few years before the DCS module for it came out. And this makes the A10C the most modern plane in the simulator, going by the date it entered service. And therefore, it has some of the more sophisticated systems to play with. Having the plane in this modern configuration simulated so well is by the way possible, because Eagle Dynamics developed training software for the A10C for the National Guard first, and managed to get permission to use the data, not the classified one obviously, but quite a bit, for a commercial product, that being the DCS A10C module. And as far as I know, the story of the earlier KE50 module is a similar one. Anyway, about the A10 itself, I think there's little for me to add that isn't already well known. The A-10 was developed as a dedicated ground attack and close air support aircraft, a slower but more rugged aircraft that could stay above in combat area longer and lower to the ground closer to the troops it was supposed to support, being more resilient to hits and carry a large amount of ordnance, to replace for example the A-1 Skyraider, which was used in this role in Vietnam, but more as an emergency solution because nothing else was available and the prop was showing its age at the time and also to be used as a dedicated tank killer to combat Soviet tanks in a possible World War III in Europe. That was the first time an aircraft for the US Air Force was specifically and from the beginning developed especially for this close air support and anti-tank role, with planes like the A-1 originally being developed as a carrier-borne dive and torpedo bomber, and of course for the Navy, and other US planes that made a name for themselves in this role earlier, like the B-47 Thunderbolt, being fighter planes with the ground attack actually not playing much of a role at all in their original development. The A-10 can carry a huge amount and variety of weapons under its wings and of course a 7 barrel 30mm Gatling gun, which fires high explosive as well as anti-tank rounds with a depleted uranium core, which is an incredible weapon that can take out most armored vehicles like APCs or infantry fighting vehicles in a single pass. It is however still just a 30mm round, even if it is a pretty big one, so modern main battle tanks will give it trouble and often need more than one pass to destroy them. But hey, that's why you have 7 tons of other weaponry hanging around your wings and fuselage. 
Well, let's take a look at the mission in the A10C and see what it can do. Now, the scenario in this mission is pretty straightforward. A friendly armored unit is preparing to attack an enemy defensive line. Take out the defending armored units and break through into the enemy rear. And we are providing air support for the attack and have three target areas. The two primary target areas are the rough locations of enemy artillery units behind enemy lines. The first being PM-30 Smirch 3mm rocket launchers and the second 2S-19 Msta Hovises. The secondary target area is the enemy main defensive position itself. Now, the artillery is the primary target to destroy for us, so it can't fire on our tanks and interfere with their attack. And our own tanks can destroy enemy tanks. They can't, however, shoot back at artillery firing at them from far behind enemy lines. So that is our main job. After this is done, we can expand any remaining ordnance on the enemy defenses to weaken them as much as possible to make the job for our own tanks easier. Friendly fast air has already dealt with long-range anti-air threats, like radar-guided SAMs. The enemy positions are however still protected by shorter-range AA threats, like the ZSU-23 Shilkas. As usual in those missions I don't bother with an NPC wingman, so we fly alone. Well, that's okay, since the A-10 carries enough ordnance for three planes. And on this mission we are bringing on top of our lightning targeting bot, under the right wing, one CBU-87 cluster bomb and three HEM-65D Maverick missiles with infrared seeker, which I intend to use as standoff weapon versus enemy air defenses, and also one of my three Hydra-70 rocket bots with seven rockets per bot. Then we got six Mark 82 500 pound freefall bombs under the fuselage, as well as a CBU-97 anti-tank cluster bomb, and the middle pylon, and on the left wing we have three GBU-12 500-pound laser-guided bombs and two more 70mm rocket bots, and an AN-ALQ-131 ECM jammer bot, and of course one 30mm Gatling gun. Now, since I'm getting closer to the target area, I start to get the plane ready to fight. Starting with doing a few changes to my countermeasure program, which I set up so that it fires two chaff and two flares every half second and doing so five times in a row. Now my ECM jammer bot has three different modes, one versus older SAMs and one versus newer model SAMs, and one versus radar guided AAA. And since I don't expect to meet any radar guided missiles, but I do expect drill cars and the like, I change it to AAA, though I should switch automatically when you set it up that way. And then of course I get my weapon systems ready, starting by flipping the switches for the master arm to arm all the weapons and turning the lightning targeting bot on and then arming the gun and the back stability system. That is one of the upgrades of the A10C, a stability system that automatically counters the recoil of the gun and allows you to stay on target easier. You can also use the gun without it if you want the recoil to push your nose up, for example, to strafe a convoy. And then we activate the Mavericks missile seeker heads so that they start to align. That takes a few minutes, so doing it now they will be ready by the time we need them. The same goes for our targeting bot, which we just activated and still need some time to boot up. I also just changed the profile of my 70mm rocket bot so that they fire in pairs and up to four pairs per trigger pull. Now, my Mark 82s I change from dropping in singles to dropping pairs as well. And I think if you're not familiar with the DCS A10 module, you already see that there's quite a bit to do in this plane, which I like. I generally don't just want to know that the plane can do a certain thing, I want to know what one has to do in order to get this done, and this module certainly shows you. Now, I have the location of the three target areas as waypoints, which I have on my moving map. The location of the main enemy defenses is pretty accurate, but the artillery units I have to look for in the target area. Also, since I expect enemy air defenses at all three locations, I change course east so I can attack the targets from the side. I want to take the AAA at a target out from range and then go in closer without overflying the other two targets and the AA in the process. Now, shortly after that, my targeting bot is ready and I can start looking for targets. First though, I quickly change the settings for my laser to latch on, which means when I press the laser trigger, the laser stays on, otherwise it will just fire as long as you hold the button down. And then I slew the bot's camera to the coordinates of the waypoint that indicates the first primary target, the Smirch rocket artillery. 
I also switched the target bot's picture over to the left multifunction display. That is because you can only get the Mavericks as well as the CDU on the right MFD and the first thing I want to do when I locate the target is to take out anti-aircraft units from longer range with my Maverick missiles. Now since the waypoint for the two primary targets which my targeting bot is currently looking towards are not showing the position of the artillery units too precisely, I have to look around a little bit for them. The targeting bot has both a normal TV camera as well as an infrared sensor. The camera picture is somewhat higher resolution, but it won't work at night of course, and with the infrared it is easier to spot the heat signature of targets from longer range. So I use the infrared picture to look around at first. And doing so I could quickly make out some white dots on the screen indicating heat sources and as I zoomed in on them they turn out to be the artillery unit I was looking for. Now I can spot the large smudge launcher vehicles and scanning the camp a bit more with the TV camera also some AA units. A few ZU-23 AA emplacements in the camp and then a little outside of it also a ZU-23 for Shilka a self-propelled radar guided AA gun and quite dangerous at close range. So this Shilka is going to be my first target for the day. I mark its location on the CDU so I can find it again should I lose it for some reason and then I get ready to attack it with a Maverick missile. The Maverick D is a pretty large anti-tank missile with an infrared seeker. It is a fire and forget missile so you can break off as soon as it is off the rail. Now, since you have the Seeker's picture on your MFD, you can use the missile as a poor man's targeting sensor if you don't have a proper one. It is not very powerful though. Now, I slew the Maverick head to the targeting bot so it was looking at the same spot and then as soon as the Maverick gets a lock, fire it at the Shilka. And then I turn away to the left and not a moment too soon as I can see the Shilka's radar extending and its turret swinging around. My missile takes it out before it can fire though. However, I get the warning from my RWR anyway from an AA threat from the other side. The warning I am getting from my RWR is indicating the radar of another radar guided anti-aircraft cannon, another Shilka, and I fire some more countermeasures and also activate my jammer bot. Now, I thought I'm out of range pretty soon of this threat since the Shilka is pretty short ranged and I don't fly that low. However, looking back to see if there are traces coming up at me and down to where the threat was coming from, I can also quickly see a smoke trail coming up from a SAM. So I do another evasive maneuver and throw out more countermeasures. The SAM is getting close but misses. It has to be a short range infrared missile since I did not get any warning from a radar other than the Shilka. My infrared missile warning system only reacted after the missile was already on its way. Now what happened I realized after evading those threats is that in turning to the left after I attacked the first Shilka I did exactly what I did not want to do. I overflew the position of the secondary target and the AAA units there, getting into their range. Now because of this close encounter I decided to change my plan. At first I was planning to take out the AA at the primary target first and destroy that target then Morning, and then time. move on to the other targets to destroy the AAA there. But now I figure it is a better idea to take out the AAA on the secondary target first as well before I get closer to the primary targets and take out the artillery. After a bit of maneuvering and looking around with my targeting bot I can identify the AA threats at the location of the secondary target, this being the main defensive line of the enemy, with quite a few tanks and other armored vehicles being there, but the ones I am concerned about for now are the two AA vehicles I spotted. One being a SA-9 Gaskin, a small PRDM with a quad Strela SAM launcher on the roof, a vehicle similar to the Humvee based Avenger and the one that probably fired the SAM at me. And on top of that there is another Shilka. I take out the SA-9 with a Maverick from standoff range and then engage the Shilka with my last Maverick. However, the missile I fire at the Shilka does not hit the target. The missile was probably fired at a bad angle, so now I am out of Mavericks and the Shilka is still up. I do however still have three GBU-12 laser guided bombs, which I will use instead. Now the GBUs are pretty accurate, but unlike the Mavericks they are of course not fire and forget weapons since they home in on the laser dot you project on the target from your plane, but since the laser is located in the targeting bot you can still maneuver after dropping the bomb as long as you are careful to do so in such a way that the bot can keep track of the target. 
This pumps themselves I drop in CCRP mode using the targeting bot to select the target. CCRP meaning continuously computed release point, so you can fly level and the computer drops the bomb when you reach the drop point for the target. The drop in this case was a bit rushed and I almost missed the window, but since the bomb is guided, you can throw the plane around a bit to still get the window. With a dump bomb you have to be more precise, of course. Now the laser guided bomb hits the Shilka and takes it out. So this is the AAA at the secondary target finally taken care of and I can operate safely at the primary target's area. There however we also have some unfinished business with AAA. We have taken out the Shilka at the artillery base but there are still two 23mm AA gun emplacements there. Now those are not radar guided and not a threat at any kind of range. However, I want to take the rocket artillery trucks out with my cannon and my rockets, so save heavier ordnance for other targets. And in order to safely get close enough to do so, I need to take those two AA guns out as well. And I plan to do so with the CBU-87 cluster bomb I carry on the rightmost station. The CBU-87 is basically a container for a lot of small explosive submunitions. It opens up at a set altitude and above the target and since it is spinning throws the submunitions out over the target area. You can adjust the area you want to cover with this bomb by adjusting the altitude it will open up at as well as how fast it spins. If you cover a larger area of course it is not covered as densely by the submunitions. Since I am mostly concerned with taking out the two guns which are closer together, I reduce the opening altitude a bit to get a denser coverage from the bomb. It is just a little lower and I hope to get a rocket truck or two as well, but the main concern at the moment are the two AA guns. Now, as with the GBU, I drop the CBU in CCRP mode from level flight, so I don't have to dive towards the target and give the CBU time to open up. Now the CBU is however not a guided weapon, so I have to be a little bit more precise with dropping it. Though being a cluster bomb not excessively so, as it will cover a larger area, that is the point of it. I drop the bomb at the two AA guns and then keep an eye on them with my targeting bot. Now the submunitions do explode in the target area, but the effect is not quite what I would have hoped. Zooming in I can see that I have taken out one of the guns as well as one rocket artillery truck and also a dent apparently, but the second gun is still up. So I decide to bring something a little bit more direct to the table and I get my Mark 82 iron bombs ready. Now being unguided bombs they are not 100% accurate of course and I don't know how close you have to get to those guns to take them out. They seem to be protected by some sort of sandbag position after all. So I want to drop multiple bombs on them. So I go to the bombs profile page and set them to ripple single, set the quantity to 3 and distance to 20 feet. Which means I will drop 3 bombs one after another and the computer will time it so that the impacts are roughly 20 feet apart on the ground and I come around to attack the gun in CCIP mode in a dive. Now here I make a mistake though. Since I have my targeting bot pointed at the gun already, I just aim at the HUD symbol indicating where the targeting bot is looking and figure I get a hit this way. However, I don't notice that just when I enter my dive the targeting bot loses track on the target and therefore I am aiming at the wrong spot when I drop the bombs. So the stick I dropped missed the target completely, a pity as the drop was otherwise good. Now I am getting a little frustrated with this little AA gun and I am also running low on fuel. I did not start with a fuel of fuel load to stay within the plane's maximum takeoff weight with all the weapons I am carrying. So I can't play around with this AA gun forever, I have to get on the primary target and destroy them before I have to RTP. So I decide I just get the rockets ready and attack the AA gun with rockets, as well as finally bring my own cannon into the game. And this does the trick, the 7mm Gatling gun takes the AA gun out and now I can destroy the artillery units and move on to the next target. Now the rocket artillery trucks are easy enough targets and after a few buses with rockets and the 30mm Gatling gun they are all taken care of and I can move on to the second primary target which is located a little bit behind the first one, that one having heavy 152mm artillery pieces. And once those heavy artillery units are taken out, the mission's primary objective would be fulfilled and it is technically a success. Though of course one should also attack the main defensive line to help the ground troops out there. But at this point I don't know if I will have the fuel for that after taking out the 152mm artillery pieces. 
However, while I have cleared the AA guns from the first primary and secondary objective, I have not done so at the second artillery base. Luckily though, there is only one Schilke at the second base, and I attack it again with GBU-12 laser guided bombs from higher altitude. However, not quite high enough to stay out of the Schilke's engagement range and the thing does start to point its guns at me as I can see on my screen, and I get a warning from the radar warning receiver just when my bomb comes off the rail, and I pull up and get into the turn to get out of the Schilke's range and drop countermeasures, and the Schilke's radar signal stop, it is still tracking me but not firing, and shortly after that the bomb takes it out. Now again, I am very low in fuel and I want to take those artillery units out as fast as possible, so that I still have some time to attack targets at the enemy defensive line. And I figured the best way to take the artillery units out as fast as possible is just to strafe them all with my 30mm gun, since they are lined up so nicely anyway. Those two S19 artillery units are based on the main battle tank chassis, which is decently armored, but the new big turrets housing the large guns is way less well armored than the original tank turret and a good and big target for the gun. Now what I have however failed to take into account with this plan is that those things, unlike the smirch trucks I attacked earlier, do actually have 50 caliber anti-aircraft machine guns on the roof. I frankly simply forgot about those. And in my low level strafing run I take some hits from those 50 caliber Tushka guns. Now the A-10 is one of those aircraft that is often called a flying tank. The thing is though, such a thing does simply not exist. You can't armor a plane like a tank, it would be too heavy. So while it certainly would take quite a lot of 50 caliber hits or some very lucky ones to bring a plane like this with all its redundant systems down, the hits still will do damage. And in this case what they seem to have done to my great annoyance is to knock out my Gatling gun. Which is a pity since I plan to use it versus PMPs later on. I did manage to take out all but one of the artillery units in this one pass though, showing how effective the gun is. Though it would have been better to be effective at somewhat longer range. Now there is one more artillery unit left I need to destroy and with my gun out of action I am running a little low on ordnance by now. But one of the things I still have is a triple ejector rack with Mark 82 500 pound bombs. So that is what I will use against the last artillery, aiming properly this time. I set the Mark 82s to drop in bears, though I only have enough for one bear and one single, and attack the last RTPs in a CCIP dive bombing attack, and the two 500 pound bombs from the first bear take out this last artillery. So the primary objective is finally achieved. I am getting more and more nervous about my fuel state though, but I figure I do have enough time for a one attack on the defensive line itself. I spot the formation of tanks and infantry fighting vehicles as I close in on this defensive line. They are close together and I have saved up something special for those. My CBU-97 anti-armor cluster bomb. Now this one is quite a bit more sophisticated and powerful than the 87 we dropped earlier. The CBU-97 will drop submunitions that float down on a parachute and release submunitions of their own. Those have small laser and infrared sensors with which they search for vehicles on their own and attack their thin roof armor with explosively shaped copper slugs from above, somewhat similar to the concept of a heat round. This is at the moment probably the most effective anti-armor weapon in the simulation and capable of destroying multiple enemy tanks or vehicles at the same time. And they do their job in this case as well. After a bit of waiting, the sub sub munitions activate and basically take out the entire armored formation I was aiming at, ripping a large hole in the enemy line. Now I still have one GBU-12 laser guided bomb and a Mark 82 iron bomb, but I decide that my fuel state is just getting too low to hang around any longer and instead I better RTP now. If I don't fly back to my home base but to the closer Kovaletti airbase and rearm and refuel there, I might get back into the action before the fight is over. So this is what I do and I land at Kovaletti airbase. Now, while rearming I decide that this time I want to take off with less weapons to keep the weight down and I don't need this much this time anyway. However, just when I'm about to start rearming I get the message that the friendly armor units have destroyed the enemy defenses, so my help is not needed any longer. And the mission is finished. Well, and that is some action in a 10 c I hope the mission could show off some of the capabilities of the plane in DCS and I am certainly quite impressed with the detail of the simulation. Well, and this is it for this video.
As always, I hope it was entertaining, thanks for watching and maybe I'll see you next time.